Good morning. How's it going? Well, I am honored to be the very first to welcome you to Philly ETE. Um, the talk of this title is called Ember 2.0, Out of the Box Productivity. For those of you who don't know me, I am noted industry thought leader, Tom Dale. You may know me better as notorious Twitter troll, Tom Dale. Perhaps we've <coughs> interacted online before. So, you know, Philly ETE, this is my first time here. You guys are all like enterprise people. Oh, it's like really intimidating, you know, being here in front of you. So I was actually at um, Apple headquarters in Cupertino the other day. So, and I was asking my friend, uh, Johnny, I was like, how should I sell Ember 2.0 to these enterprise folks, this enterprise crowd? He said, well, Tom, we were locked in a white room. He said, Tom, it's quite easy. Just describe Ember 2.0 as the thinnest, lightest, most powerful ember ever. <laughs> I said, that sounds really good, Johnny. I would buy that framework. Before I talk about ember, I want to talk a little bit about JavaScript in general, and more specifically, why I think you should consider building client-side JavaScript apps, 100% JavaScript apps. None of these little sprinkles of JavaScript that you progressively enhance your server apps with, but honest to gosh, uh, client-side JavaScript. And there's a couple of good arguments, I think, for making the shift from a traditional server-rendered web application to the client side. Um, and maybe the biggest one is just consistency and coherence in your code base and in your architecture. So when we started building web applications to be consumed by a browser, things were pretty straightforward and things were pretty simple. Typically, you'd be using some kind of MVC framework on the server, like Rails or Django or something like this. And that model view controller maps approximately to a database at the back end, and then you have some authorization and authentication in the middle, and then you're rendering your HTML on the client. And that HTML is delivered, of course, to the web browser. And you, again, you might sprinkle some JavaScript on there, but by and large, the responsibility for building the UI of your web application lives on this server in the data center. Well, there's a small problem, though, because now your manager comes to you, and your manager says, hey, we need to build this mobile application. And of course, mobile apps, iOS apps, Android apps, those aren't built using HTML and JavaScript. Those are built using things like Cocoa and the Android SDK. So now we have a small problem, which is we have this app that needs to talk to the server, but it can't understand natively this HTML. It's not a browser. It's, a, it's an operating system. So what do we do? Well, as my friend Brandon Hayes likes to say, we're an agile shop. We're just going to agile a little API in there. Just agile it right in there. So now we've bolted this API on to our, to our HTTP server, but now we've really got two responsibilities in one code base. We have something that's responsible for building and generating the UI for one particular slice of the platforms that you support, which it happens to be the web, and you have another API that every other platform that you support uses. So what I want to offer instead is a simplification. I think as engineers, we all believe in the uh, single responsibility principle. Our code bases are easier to reason about when they're doing one thing, and our architecture is easier to reason about when it's doing one thing. We're just replacing that UI layer with an API, and now every client talks to that API in the same way, and all that we're saying is that the web clients, now that the browser is such a capable application runtime, we don't need to give it this special architecture. We don't need to treat it with kid gloves anymore. We can treat the web as a full-blown platform, as a full-blown application runtime. And this is really great, too, because it means bringing new platforms into your product or into the service that you offer is really easy. You have a battle-tested API, and you can consume it from different directions. Uh, and it's all just one nice API. In fact, I know uh, a, a few companies uh, are building it out like this, where their client front end and their back end CMS admin tool they're both, for example, Ember apps, and they're all talking to the same API. It's just one happens to have write access and the other one's read-only. Another great reason for building JavaScript client-side apps, is, of course, is the responsiveness. And I think that this is why people started reaching for JavaScript in the first place, like in the early 2000s, the first Ajax applications. You could interact much more quickly. And, and proponents of server-rendered applications always say, well, hey, you know, on a fast internet connection, it doesn't really matter. Most people are sitting in their office. They have a fast broadband connection. 
Um, they're connected with a fast computer, so that round trip to the data center really doesn't matter. But actually, I would say that it does. Any time that you have a client that has to confer with a server on the back end before it does anything or before it displays any information to the user, that starts to feel bad. And the only reason that people put up with it today is because they're conditioned to do it. But of course, when you want rich interactivity, you turn to JavaScript, right? I, and the example that I like to use is, it's kind of an uh, argumentum ad absurdum, but imagine if everything that you did on a web page had to go talk to a server. So I mocked up uh, in Ember, here's a component where it, I just added a 200 millisecond delay. But it feels awful, right? This is a slider where we just add 200 milliseconds. And then on the bottom is a client-side slider where it interacts instantly. Now this seems a little absurd. Of course, no one would want to interact with a control where every time you used it, we introduced a 200 millisecond latency. But indeed, on the web, that's what we're doing every day. And the only reason that it's OK for this to happen is because users are conditioned to it. But this same principle applies everywhere. If you have the data and the templates and the logic to respond to your users when they click, even when they're clicking a link, that's the experience that you should be offering because you know what? Your competitors are. The people building products that are competing with you, they see that it's coming. And I, I think this especially applies to client-side routing. People are sprinkling JavaScript on their pages and that's getting them so far, but at the end of the day, every time you click a link, you throw that entire state away, you have to go back to the server and you have to download all this HTML, all of the CSS again, you have to rebuild the page, and that imparts a significant penalty. It doesn't matter how fast their computer is or how fast that connection is, you still have this minimum latency. So take that example of an interactive control. It works responsibly because we have all the information we need right there on the client. And Basically, what we're saying is let's move more and more and more and more of the responsibilities of a client, of an application, a web application, to the client so it can respond like that when the user clicks, even as something as fundamental as a link. And this shift to client-side architecture also unlocks a lot of other capabilities. Uh, offline apps are the biggest one. Now, I remember reading a blog post by DHH who says, you know, offline doesn't really matter because what's happening is that Internet connections are becoming so pervasive that you're really never in a situation where you're not going to have an internet connection. And I can tell DHH doesn't fly United because on my way here, I did not have an internet connection at all, which ended up being great for working on the talk because I didn't have any distractions. But there were some cases where I really would have liked to have access to this data offline. And the fact that I can open my phone and read all of my emails, but I can't log into gmail.com and view my emails just because one happens to be using, written using web technology. That's bullshit. So I think the point of moving to client-side applications, one big thing it unlocks is the ability to do these offline applications. I think that's going to be important. And again, I think your competitors are thinking about that as well. So why Ember specifically? There's a lot of choice in the JavaScript ecosystem. And I'm going to make the pitch to you that I think Ember is probably a great choice for you to use on your team. Uh, and especially if you're in the enterprise where you're building products and services that last for a very long time, I'm going to make the case that Ember is probably the best choice for you. Uh, one of the biggest advantages of Ember is that it is a very opinionated framework and it top to bottom tries to answer the question of how do you build the best web applications in the industry. Um, now there's a lot to that, productivity out of the box, that covers a lot of topics. There's only a few that I want to cover today just because I only have an hour and not like eight hours. Um, those are the fact that it comes, Ember comes with sophisticated tools. It's not just a JavaScript framework. It's not just an MVC framework. I think of Ember as the whole experience top to bottom, and that includes things like build tools and debugging tools. Um, I want to show you some cool new stuff we've been doing with animations. I think that Ember has the best, most easy to use story for adding declaratively animations onto apps, including apps that already exist. And then I just want to talk a little bit about our rapidly growing ecosystem and show you basically why Ember and its convention over configuration on both the build tools and the application architecture, those are the two pieces that you need to unlock a really powerful uh, ecosystem for things like plugins. So let's talk about the tools. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is something called the Ember Inspector. How many people here have used the Ember Inspector before? Can you raise your hand? Okay, just a few of you. Okay, awesome. Not gonna have my surprise ruined. So if you're not familiar with the Ember Inspector, this is an extension for Firefox and Chrome, and this brings extremely powerful 
uh, debugging and analysis tools to the browser. And you can do this with any, any Ember application. You can fire it up and you can get a very visual sense of how this application is architected and how it's behaving. So uh, the first thing I'll show you, this is how you open the Ember inspector. Uh, this is bustle.com. It's an Ember app running in production. You can follow along on your laptops, assuming the Wi-Fi is holding up. Uh, and you just go to the developer tools, you open it up, and you can see that the extension adds a new tab to the, to the developer tools there. So just open it up, and you can start poking around. Now, if you haven't used Ember before, there's uh, an important thing that I'll, I'll just describe to you about how it works. And that is, in Ember, the way that routing works is you have these nested templates. And each template is paired with a model and a component. And that is the thing that makes up your URL. So as your user navigates around the, your application, Ember is responsible for putting templates and their respective models, those two things are joined, putting them on screen, taking them off screen, and making sure that that URL stays up to date as the user navigates around, right? So quite simple. You just have a hierarchy of templates. Each template is backed by a model. And what's really cool for learning Ember, this is an example from the product I work on called Skylight, is that you can open up this section called the view tree. And as you hover over it, it's actually going to show you in the browser which section is, uh, is highlighted. So you hover over it, and it's going to highlight it in the DOM. And you can actually click on the model backing that template, and you can explore it with tools that you're already used to. If, you're, if you know how to use the Chrome developer tools. So this is the kind of powerful tools for building JavaScript applications that other frameworks just don't have. And what I think is particularly cool about this, uh, if we click on one of these models, you'll see that we actually get this inspector over here. And this is a live two-way binding. This is great for playing around with UI. You can see if I click here on a date, I think this is so cool. If you click on a date on your model, it's actually going to open up a date picker. And you can change that date to see how your UI responds to changes that you make. So a live two-way binding, isn't that cool? It works for strings, booleans, dates, all sorts of things. This makes it extremely easy to iterate on UI, because your designer gives you a design. And of course, you want to test all the edge cases. What happens if the user's name is really short? What happens if I put a, a German word in here and it's 60 characters long? Wasn't expecting that one. This lets you see immediately how your UI responds to test data that you put in there. It's great for designers. Designers love this. So click, up comes the, the date picker, and then boom. You can see that, that that's a handlebars template up there just responding instantly. Isn't that so cool? The other thing that's really useful, uh, how many of you have used JavaScript promises? OK, a lot of JavaScript developers here. If you use promises, you've probably been frustrated by them. Because you have things like promises swallowing errors. Some uh, promise rejects, and you're trying to debug it. You're like, what happened? Well, the Ember inspector comes with an extremely powerful tool for visualizing all of the promises, or visualizing all the asynchronous behavior in your application. You can see things like, was the promise fulfilled? Was the promise rejected? You can get stack traces. If a promise is rejected, you can click the stack trace button and see where that rejection came from. You can even take values from any promise in the system and put it in the console. You just click a single button, and now you can actually play around with it in the console. This is a hugely powerful tool for debugging how your asynchronous behavior is working. And then the last thing I want to show is pretty cool. This is an example from the Nest online store. This is using Ember Data. So Ember Data is a, an ORM, uh, kind of similar to Active Record. Um, but running in the browser. And what's cool about this is you can see that as I add uh, a product to my cart, I can see the models as they appear in the browser. So you can see all the model types here. You have a, uh, you have a column for each attribute. And as I navigate around and as I start manipulating the data on this page, you can see this inspector updating in real time. So how many times have you been trying to debug the AJAX coming into your web application and you're trying to make sense of it? This is a beautiful visualization that makes it really easy to understand the models that are defined in your system, the data that's loaded and cached locally. If you make any changes locally, it will show them in a different color so you can see what's coming from the server and what are local modifications. Uh, and it also lets you explore the relationships between that data, which is really, really useful. Now this inspector, this is definitely like enterprise grade stuff, but it's available. This is for free. 
you can get it on both the Mozilla add-on marketplace for Firefox and in the Chrome store. So the next tool that's been huge for us over the last year that I want to talk about is something called Ember CLI. So Ember CLI is a set of conventional opinionated build tools for building Ember applications. And if there's one thing I've learned in my career over the last few years, it's that software engineers in particular love to have meetings to decide the stupidest crap. Like, I have seen companies spend two weeks trying to decide what files should be named, or whether they should use gulp or grunt, or whether they should use less or sass. People, you're wasting so much time, you guys. Like, do you know how much time you're wasting? It's a lot, because these are what we call trivial decisions. Now, it's not to say that you shouldn't have any choice. It's just that you should be spending time working on the problems that matter to your users and not what makes you feel most warm and fuzzy as a developer. So with Ember CLI, we basically give you a set of conventions for how you're going to build your application out of the box. And that's not to suggest that it's not modular or that it's not flexible. If you have a really good reason for replacing a component, well, you can do that but you'd better have a darn good reason because this is the build tool that the whole community builds on. And when you deviate from that, you're deviating from a lot of the power of that convention. So out of the box, when you create a new Ember CLI app, it's gonna give you uh, one Babel. Now Babel is a tool that will take ES6, ES7, those are the next versions of JavaScript. It'll take that future syntax and it will compile down into ES3, which works in, in browsers today. It will give you automatic rebuilds and reloads. So if you edit a file, you save it, it will automatically rebuild your application and reload in your browser. This makes the development process very smooth. Gives you a conventional file structure. You can cancel that two week of uh, ongoing meetings to decide how you're gonna organize your files. It does it for you out of the box. And in fact, it does a lot of the wiring up that you would have to do by hand thanks to that powerful naming convention. A built-in unit and integration test. So out of the box, you have a new app, you have a testing harness, no, oh, someone's gonna set that up in a few weeks. Next thing you know, a year later, you've shipped an app with no tests. Uh, and minification and concatenation. So you build your app with Ember CLI, it is ready to go to production in the best possible way to deliver the best performance for your users. So creating a new Ember CLI application is very simple. You'll just uh, Ember new and the name of your app, you'll see it'll create it for you. It will install all of the dependencies you need to have a great experience, Ember, Ember Data, jQuery, et cetera, uh, using NPM and Bower. It takes care of all of that for you. The NPM takes a bit. It's really sad as I was doing this on the airplane, so I had to edit it down in a video editor. It took like three minutes. <sighs> NPM. Uh, what's also cool, uh, as I mentioned, is that you get ES6 and ES7 syntax out of the box. So this, uh, if you're unfamiliar here, uh, this is syntax for modules. This is a default export. You also get concise methods. You can see we don't have to say colon function. We also get fat arrows, which bind this. So you don't have to say var self equals this. I'm sure if you've written JavaScript, you've gotten very used to this. And I think what's really incredible about this is that the code that you see here is not something that some apps have. Because it's built into every single Ember CLI app, the Ember community has really started to adopt these features. Um, Yehuda Katz, uh, my coworker, is on TC39, and he always comes, uh, TC39, if you're not familiar, is the technical committee, uh, it stands for Technical Committee 39, they're very creative at naming at ECMA. Um, he always comes back from these meetings and he talks about the proposals that people have brought, and then we actually incorporate, essentially the future of the web platform, we incorporate that back into Ember as a framework. And this, I think, is a great way for us to actually deliver feedback back to the standards body. So all of these Ember developers around the world are testing these new features thanks to Ember CLI. They let us know what their feedback is, what works, what doesn't, and then we can, we have this very nice virtuous cycle between TC39 implementing these new, or proposing these new features and us being able to get feedback on them right away. And importantly, this is a project that's supported by the core team. So it's not like a set of build tools that 1%, 5% of the community use. I would say probably like 90 to 95% of the community use these build tools. So every time you read a tutorial, you read the documentation covers this, getting started guides, this is a, a tool that you can rely on everyone in the community using. And because of that, everyone kind of feeds back 
and improves uh, along, and you migrate along with the community. And I think uh, that's an important thing, that you basically, as a community, you're migrating and improving not just the framework itself, but also this whole ecosystem and these tools. Because the thing that that unlocks by having this shared, this convention over configuration, the shared architecture, not just in the application, but in the tooling around it, it unlocks incredibly powerful add-ons. So this is an example, this is emberaddons.com. And I actually had to update the screenshot. When I took a screenshot in December, it had something like 300 packages. As of last night, it was at 842. So this ecosystem is exploding. And it makes it so easy to rapidly build out a prototype and then build out a production grade application. Because everything that you might want to do, every time I, I want to do something, I come to emberaddons.com and it's already there. I want the other day to add uh, fonts from Adobe Typekit. Boom, there's a Typekit add-on. If you want to add like real-time data, boom, Emberfire is a, is a officially uh, maintained add-on from Firebase that just one command, boom, you've got real-time model data in your application. It's astounding to me what a difference it makes between a single command and spending an hour or two setting something up. It makes you so much more willing. I take on side projects on the weekends now that I can bang out in a few hours that before, just it would take a few hours just to set up all the infrastructure. This is a huge productivity win. And it's not just JavaScript. It's not just like add-ons are a way for you to add JavaScript plugins, like jQuery plugins to your application. It's much more than that. You can plug into the build system. You can add your own concatenation. You can add your own minification. You can add your own CSS preprocessor. Uh, you can hook into the deployment process. So there are a ton of uh, static hosts for web applications, things like DivShot and Firebase. One command will deploy to staging, and then a single other command will promote that staging build to production. Um, this is, I think, really huge. The fact that we now have this conventional build tooling that anyone can plug into. Um, I, I saw a really great talk at EmberConf uh, earlier this year by someone from the, uh, Brittany Storos from the Firefox OS team. And she was talking about how even though not everyone uses Ember, they were able to adapt Ember CLI because it's so flexible to be the build tooling that you use to build Firefox OS apps. And again, that all relies on this convention over configuration. The key to unlocking this is having that convention in both the application architecture and in the build tools. You need both. Without both of those, one can't reason about the other. And what this allows for is in the community, Ember is all about rolling in the best practices. Ember is about, as developers, all climbing the mountain together. And the best way to do that is to allow the community a period of experimentation via this add-on system. Make it really easy for people to test out experiments in their apps, see what works and then what doesn't. And then over time, because we're all operating on the same assumptions, we can start rolling the best ideas out of that experimental group back into the framework and making it a first class part of the experience. And that, a lot of that is in Ember 2.0. It's about rolling the best ideas from the community back into the framework. The next thing I want to touch on just briefly is animation. Now animation used to be quite difficult in, in Ember. It's a very declarative system and layering animation on top of that was much different than what people were used to. And this is a good example of what I was talking about, about rolling experimentation back into the framework. So uh, a gentleman named Edward Faulkner, who is now on the Ember core team, wrote a library called Liquid Fire. I just want to show you how easy it is to add animation to an Ember app. This is an example, uh, this is an example that I stole from, Ember, uh, from Edward's EmberConf talk, and I highly recommend it. It was a fabulous talk, if you have the time. But uh, in this video, you can see clicking and dragging, or sorry, clicking on one of these links, you can see that it, it does this explode animation. And if you click on one of these fields, you can see it animates the height. So what's really incredible about this is that this HTML isn't Edward's. Edward scraped the EmberConf website. He pulled our HTML and our CSS. And then all he did is using his library, he added uh, in, in a liquid fire app, there's a file called transitions.js. And all you do is declaratively define how these elements on the page move from one route to the other. And, the, and then Liquid Fire takes care of doing that animation, including, again, quite sophisticated ones, like this, like this explosion, right? 
And so you can get transitions between screens, right? That's the, that's the really hard thing to do on the web. Animations within a page, okay. Animations across transitions, that's hard. And that's the kind of thing you really need client-side routing for, because you need to keep these elements consistent. You can't be throwing everything away and going back to the server. So Liquid Fire unlocks animations as sophisticated as that using this very nice, concise, declarative API. You just say, this is how this element moves from this screen to this screen, in this case saying from this route to this route, using the explode animation. I think that's huge. Uh, again, I won't go into depth here, but if this is interesting to you, just Google for Ember Liquid Fire. Edward has set up a bunch of great documentation, great examples, and again, I highly recommend his Ember Conf talk. So the next thing I want to talk a little bit about is performance. Because I think, historically, Ember has sometimes had a reputation as not being as fast as bare metal libraries, things like Backbone or, or even React. And at React.js Conf, which I think was earlier this year, late last year, uh, my friend Ryan Florence gave a talk where he compared an application, the same application written in Ember, written in Angular, and written in React. And what he was showing was a pathological case in Ember. He was basically showing a, a table with a bunch of data, and that data in Ember, everything is bound, right? So whenever you put some data into a template, we set up a bunch of observers. And if you're putting thousands of items into that template, and then two milliseconds later tearing them all down, that's gonna be really slow. And so uh, I'll show you the, the demo here. This is uh, the version in running in React. You can see that it's quite fast. And importantly, there's another thing to call out here, which is that uh, this is using Bootstrap, Twitter Bootstrap. And when you hover over any one of these values, this is actually coming from a real app. I can't, I can't be upset at Ryan um, for this benchmark because this is derived from a real application they had at their company. And this is for monitoring nodes in their database cluster. And if you hover over one of these values, you, it'll show you the SQL query that generated it, right? So this is coming from a real application. And this is React, and you can see it's performing very well. Every time this value changes, you can see that the pop-up updates as well. And then he showed the Ember app. And uh, I guess the best word to describe this was embarrassing. This was obviously not good. You can see it's just running at a fraction of the performance of the React version, and it's so slow that the browser doesn't even know what to do anymore with this pop-up, because the second that you render the new data, you're immediately tearing it down. Um, the, the memory usage was not good here either. So we watched this talk, and, and that was embarrassing for us, because of course, you know, most people build Ember apps, most people don't end up having performance issues, but when you're using a framework and you wanna build a feature that requires performance and you can't do it because of the technology you've chosen, that, that sucks. It sucks for us and it sucks for you. We never want you to have to say no to some user experience that your designer wants just because of the technology that you've chosen. These are the two side by side, which makes the difference even more stark. So that's why uh, Yehuda and I saw this and we thought we need to do something about this. So at EmberConf uh, last month, we announced a brand new rendering engine for Ember that we, uh, we we're working on. This is called Glimmer. And just to give you uh, an idea of what that looks like, this is the same demo app. Oh wait, this is, that's definitely the old Ember. Here is, uh, here is Ember on the left, React in the middle, and then Glimmer on the right. You can see that these are night and day differences. So when we went to go build React, uh, sorry, when we went to go build Glimmer, we knew we had to do two things. One, we had to have performance that could meet or exceed that of React. And we also knew that we had to do it in a backwards compatible way because we would have been dealing with a riot if we had launched Glimmer and said everyone needs to rewrite their applications to take advantage of the speed. So to explain to you how Glimmer works, we were hugely inspired by React. React pioneered a lot of great new techniques for browser rendering. And I'll walk you through first how, how React works and then I will contrast our approach which is a, a refinement of the React method. So uh, if you're not familiar with React, this is how you would define a component. A component has a render method on it, and the render method can return something called JSX. And this is just a way of representing XML inside of a JavaScript file. So this is saying this component, when it renders, is going to return a div, 
And inside of that, there's an H2 with some static content. There's a P tag with some static content. There's a P tag with some dynamic content. And then you can see we have an A element that has a dynamic href attribute. And of course, this is a very simple component, but this is just JavaScript, right? So every time you run this function, from React's point of view, it could be doing anything. It doesn't know what's going on here. Um, so far as I know, React has not yet solved the halting problem. Therefore, it actually has to execute this render function to know what it has done. So let's zoom in here a little bit more closely just on the, on the XML. Well, what happens when a re-render occurs? Which mean, and a re-render occurs means that some of this underlying data may have changed. Well, remember that React works by operating with a virtual DOM. What the virtual DOM does is it basically builds a, a virtual, a, JavaScript, a pure JavaScript representation of the DOM, DOM tree, keeps that around, and then on the second render, it compares these two trees and applies some very smart heuristics to make that performance good. So what it has to do uh, when you return a new element is it needs to figure out what changed between last time and this time. So what that means is, okay, first we're gonna look at the div. Did the div change? Is it a different element? Does it have new attributes? Does it, did it lose some attributes? No, okay, that's static. Okay, well, how about the h2? We can see, looking at it as humans, looking at this, we can see that, of course, nothing will ever change. Okay, so nothing's changed there. p tag, we're looking at it again. Again, we're diffing it, the element and all its attributes. Okay, nothing has changed here. Oh, now we have some dynamic content. Okay, now we're gonna look at that text node inside the p tag. Let's see if anything changed there or not. And then perhaps go update the DOM. And then, uh, now this a tag is an interesting case because we can't just check the element. Now we have this href attribute, so we need to check that because you can see that if props.username has changed, we're gonna need to diff that and update the actual attribute in the DOM. So you can see that's, uh, that's a number of steps. We check the a tag and then it works. Now obviously, this is fast enough. In most, ca in most cases, this is so fast that it doesn't end up mattering. But particularly in large apps where there's a lot of static content, I know in our application we have these big templates and there's a ton of static content in them. We've actually found a way to optimize this path even further. Uh, and to show you how we do that, let me show you what a, a handlebars template looks like. If you're not familiar with handlebars, you can see it's just a sub, uh, superset of HTML and all of the dynamic bits are in those double curlies. I've highlighted them here in purple. So because handlebars templates in an Ember app in, in the Glimmer engine are compiled ahead of time, and most importantly, because we're not using JavaScript, which is Turing complete, we're using a much more declarative syntax. At compile time, handlebars can look at this. They can say, oh, I see that all of these elements are static, and I know that there is no way for that div or that h2 or that first p to ever change. So what it does is that when there's a re-render, instead of checking all of those nodes, we first check just this bound adders.username, has it changed? Yes or no? Go update the DOM. And then we check this attribute, which we know is dynamic. Has it changed? Yes or no? And you can see that then that's it, that's it. And you can see that that's a far fewer number of steps. And the way that we do this under the hood, I think is quite cool, the architecture that we've come up with. We've come up uh, with something we've called a render node. We call this object that does this bookkeeping a render node. And when we re-render, we basically go through the render node, and the render node has a pointer into the DOM. A render, each render node points to a single DOM element, or an attribute in the case of the second here. And we basically go through each render node, and we say, go update yourself, go pull the value from the model. So that's going to put the new value into the DOM, and most importantly, it's going to cache the last seen value. It's gonna cache it. And we go on to the next one. This is gonna update the attribute. And again, it's going to cache the last value that it's seen. And so what's cool here is that when we re-render, all that happens in a re-render is we mark these render nodes as being dirty. So if we detect some kind of change, whether it's from a model changing or whether it's from the user manually re-rendering a component, we don't actually do anything right away. All we do is mark each of these render nodes as dirty, and we schedule a re-render. Now when that re-render is scheduled, what happens is we'll go through all of the dirty nodes one by one, and before we touch anything with the DOM, we just diff, okay, what was the last value we've seen and what's the last value now? 
So we never touch the DOM unless these values actually change. We're simply diffing, we're doing a quality check between the last value and the current value. This lets us quickly get out, this is a fast path for the majority case, which is when nothing has changed. And then we go into the next one. Now we clear that render node, we say it's no longer dirty. And we do this next with the attribute, we do a quality check, and you can see that in this case, in this re-render, this is what we'll call an item potent re-render, nothing has changed. So we can leave everything as it was, and you can see that this was very cheap. All of this, the scheduling, the marking is dirty, these are extremely cheap operations. And so you can think of Glimmer as being a tree of render nodes. This is how the rendering engine works under the hood. Rather than creating a virtual DOM, we create a tree of render nodes. And we support a rendering model similar to uh, React, which is in React you would say set state on a component. In Ember the equivalent dirty is all of the child render nodes. Or if you're using a traditional observer system, sometimes the performance of that is going to be better. You can render just a single render node and not, uh, sorry, dirty just a single render node and not dirty all of its children. In this case, it'll walk the tree, but only check this one. And so the rendering process is just going down this list, this tree of render nodes, and it first says, is it dirty? And has the value changed? And if either of those two tests fail, then no DOM is touched. And that's how we get the performance that you saw in that video. Now I think the best way to think about the difference here in Glimmer versus React is that in React, you're building a diff of, you're diffing a tree of virtual DOM nodes, right? And anytime you do a render, there's just gonna be more DOM elements than there are bound values. And in Glimmer, we're simply diffing a tree of values, each of those values represented by a render node. And I think perhaps something even cooler is uh, under the hood, the way that Glimmer works is each render node, the value that it gets is just an abstraction that we call a stream. And the stream is responsible not only for telling the render node what the current value is, as you saw a slide ago, it's also responsible for dirtying the render node. And I think what's, what's cool about this is that you can actually model using this system Ember 1x semantics, which is when you put a property into the DOM, you set up an observer, Whenever that observer, whenever that property changes, you schedule the render node, just that render node to re-render. You can actually, using the system, implement Angular style dirty checking. If you wanted to implement Angular styles dirty checking, uh, whenever anything changed, you would simply mark all of the nodes as dirty. Again, a very cheap operation. You would go through the whole thing, and actually, this would be a slight improvement, um, I think, on the Angular model because it would only have to diff the values that were actually in DOM rather than the whole scope. Um, but you could get semantics that were very similar, and a programming model that was very similar. And lastly, of course, you can implement the React style, where the re-render only happens when you set state on a component. And again, that's just always waiting for the user to explicitly dirty a tree or a subtree of render nodes, and then persisting those into the DOM. And I think, I, I wanna give a shout out to React here, because by far, I think, the biggest innovation in React is this notion of DOM element stability. That is huge from a performance point of view, trying to reuse as many DOM nodes as possible, keeping them in the DOM, updating them. It avoids a lot of reflow, it re avoids a lot of paint cost, and actually it has pretty big user interface considerations as well. You're not blowing away selection state. You're not blowing away the scroll position. A lot of uh, JavaScript frameworks before, uh, Ember included, would kind of be bad citizens in the sense that they could be Inadvertently, if you weren't very careful, they could be very aggressive about tearing down entire trees of DOM and rebuilding it. And I think the biggest thing that we've learned from React is that trying to be conservative and keeping the DOM as close as you can when things don't change very much, that gives you not only huge performance benefits, but huge UX benefits as well. So I think the, the most amazing thing about Glimmer is that we're doing it in a way that's 100% backwards compatible, and this is a big part of our, our message for Ember, which is uh, something we call stability without stagnation. We know that people get tired of the, the hype in JavaScript, and we don't want people to have to rewrite their apps, so we are bringing this kind of React levels of performance to every Ember app that has been written today and is on the 1X series. So uh, Glimmer is coming in the Ember 1.13 release, actually, uh, you can track our progress at isemberfastyet.com. 
Spoiler alert, no. Uh, but you can, you can watch our progress. We're, I think, uh, about 400 tests away. Ember has a suite of like eight or 9,000 tests, and we're very, very close. I think we're at like 90%, but uh, there are a couple, we care a lot about backwards compatibility, and there's a couple of backwards compatibility edge cases that we need to get hammered out. Uh, but we're very excited. That should be merging hopefully in the next few weeks. Uh, one other thing I want to talk about is something, a feature we've been working on in Ember for a while now called Fastboot. And I talked a little bit earlier in this presentation about why people like client-side JavaScript applications. There's a lot of benefits to writing client-side JavaScript apps. But there are downsides as well. There are a lot of perks to server-rendered applications. Just to name a few, uh, consistent performance. You have control over the performance of your servers. You can monitor them, including excellent Sky products like Skylight for your Rails app to find out how fast your server's running. Harder to walk into the home of your customer and give them a new smartphone if their phone is running a little bit poorly. Another thing is a fast initial render. You deliver HTML to them right away. And so they're not having to download this big multi-hundred kilobyte JavaScript payload just to see some UI. And lastly, web crawlers. Now, Google evaluates JavaScript. It will parse JavaScript. But there are a lot of other tools out there, scraping tools, things like curl. And of course, don't forget uh, valuable links users, some of the highest converting by revenue. So there are a lot of people in the community who want to scold you into something that they call progressive enhancement. They'll say JavaScript is no good. Server rendered JavaScript is no good. And I find this attitude a little bit condescending. I think anytime you try to stop the march of progress by scolding people into certain behavior is probably a sign that you're on the way out. I think progressive enhancement, if you're not familiar, the idea is you want to build a traditionally server rendered web application and then you sprinkle JavaScript on top. You basically bring it to life. So it's a totally fully functional application, but then you make it more interactive after the fact uh, with the JavaScript. And there's two big problems with this. The, the first is that there's no client-side routing. And as I, I tried to address a little bit earlier, I think client-side routing, if you're doing your routing on the server and not in the client, in five years, I, I believe your app is going to feel pretty busted. Every click is going to feel like trudging through molasses compared to your competitors, which are using a client-side framework, where every click is so fast. But probably the biggest one is that with progressive enhancement, complexity grows exponentially with each new feature. Because you're, you're tackling so much by hand, you've essentially signed up to tackle a very hard distributed computing problem in an ad hoc manner, right? Because now you have state on the client, and you have state on the server, and sometimes what's displayed is decided here, and other times it's decided here. And personally, I'm just not smart enough to figure out problems like that in an ad hoc way. I really need a system and an abstraction to help me reason about it. So I'll make the argument here that progressive enhancement as a technique anyway, is dead. I think it's obvious people are moving away from it. It's just too much work. It's too much work, and it doesn't benefit enough users to make it worth it from a business point of view for most people. And of course, there are always caveats, and there's always, uh, there are always going to be exceptions to any rule. But I would say, by and large, if you look at industry trends, people are abandoning progressive enhancement and using frameworks like React, Angular, and Ember. But I think that's kind of a shame also. I, as much as I dislike the scolding and the wagging of fingers of people using JavaScript, I do have to admit that there are a lot of benefits. Some of them I just enumerated. There are a lot of benefits to server-side applications. So I, I would ask you the question, what if, instead of asking you to manually wire up your application after the fact, do the server render and then wire up the JavaScript by hand, what if we could get all of those same benefits that we talked about with server-side rendering, what if we could get those benefits purely as a byproduct of the way that we develop applications anyway? What if you could get the best of both worlds, and kind of bend that curve of trade-offs that you've historically had to make? And, and that's what Fastboot is. Fastboot is simply a way of taking the Ember application that you would build anyway and kind of pre-initializing it on the server, booting it up, running it on the server, and so when the first request that comes into your, from your user, instead of seeing JavaScript in a white page or a loading spinner, we give them the HTML. And then only afterwards do we transition over to a client-side approach. 
So one thing I want to clarify here, there's a, a point of confusion. People get confused by this a lot. And when we say, we, when we talk about fast boot, it doesn't replace your existing server. If you have a Rails app, if you have a Django app, if you have a Java app, it's not replacing that API server. The API is the same as in that diagram I showed at the opening of the presentation. Rather, it works like this. You have a browser, a user has a browser, and they go visit your blog, bloggymcbloggerson.com, and they're gonna get slash posts. Sorry, you'll, you'll allow me one flame transition in this, in this slide deck. So they're gonna hit your CDN. And that CDN is going to return an empty HTML, right? It's just an HTML file that points at your JavaScript and your CSS. And then they're going to download that JavaScript. And it doesn't matter what website, what library or framework people are using. It seems like every website I visit has like at least 500K of JavaScript. It doesn't matter what, what it is. Uh, so either way, it's gonna be big. And then that comes in. And now you have your JS app. But even that, unless you do something special, is not enough. Because now you get a loading spinner, but now that JavaScript app still needs to go to your JSON API server, and needs to actually go fetch the data. So now it's gonna go fetch post.json, and that's gonna come back. And only now, after all of those steps, do you have a usable user interface. And I bet many of you have built applications like this today. Here's how Fastboot is different. With Fastboot, okay, we have the browser, same as before, but now when we get posts, instead of going to your CDN for the JavaScript or the HTML, it's going to the Fastboot server. And the Fastboot server is actually sitting in the same data center as your API server. Again, it doesn't replace the API server. It sits next to it in the data center. And it's going to go prefetch that JSON data for you. Again, it's the same app. It's just your Ember app. It's just now instead of running in a browser, it's running in a node instance in the data center. It's gonna go fetch the JSON data just as it would if it were running in the browser. But again, it's in the same data center, so it's very fast. And now it's gonna do that rendering on the Fastboot server, and it's gonna deliver the HTML to the user right away. So the, the thing that they're seeing is not a loading spinner or a blank page. They're seeing the HTML content that they would have seen you know, a few seconds down the, the, down the line if we were using a traditional architecture. And only once that initial HTML has loaded does the JavaScript kind of catch up to the HTML. It loads up, and from that point, it takes over. And now you have your JS app. And now from this point forward, architecturally, it's no different. This is purely a way of getting content to the user faster. And of course, if they have a browser with JavaScript disabled or they're on a slower device, they can get usable content right away. Uh, Twitter wrote a blog post about this. They called it the thing that they measure the time to first tweet. And that's what this is improving. And I think, not to get ahead of ourselves, but I think that this really changes the way that we build apps, build web apps anyway. It changes the calculus about how we decide on the trade-offs between server and client. So these are very early days, um, and this is still very alpha. Although there are people using it, I, I have the GitHub issues to prove people are starting to actually roll it out and use it. But I think this is uh, one of the most exciting things to come along in a half decade or so. Um, and I have to give a big thank you. Uh, there's a company in, uh, in New York called Bustle, uh, the Bustle Labs. I have to give them a big thank you. They sponsored Yehuda and I to give the first spike out, not only of Glimmer, but also Fastboot. So they have been funding all of that work. And there was no strings attached. They were basically like, we will hire you to work on open source. It was really great. So a big thank you to them. And if you use Ember, I, if you see anyone from Bustle at any conference or anything, please uh, give them a big thanks on my behalf. So I want to talk about Ember 2.0 just real briefly and the, the plan. Now, we're doing something a little bit unusual with Ember 2.0, very different than anything else in the ecosystem. And that is most of the Ember 2.0 features are actually available today. And what we're doing is we're developing all of the new features on master. So every new release, we release every six weeks. Every new release, we add more and more features. And we also start deprecating older features. So they don't go away, they don't break but you'll just get a warning saying, hey, in 2.0, this feature may not be available anymore. And so counterintuitively, perhaps, Ember 2.0 doesn't actually add new features. It's not like a big bang or rewrite. We simply remove all the stuff that we've been deprecating over the last 18 months. So we think that this model is the best way to migrate a community as a whole, because instead of having this big bang release where it's like, ah, oh, crap, 
I have to rewrite the app, basically. You know, Try justifying that to your manager. Hey, I need 18 sprints to rewrite the app. Like, yeah, OK, you're fired. Um, so, so what we've been trying to do is essentially help you, help you amortize the upgrade over 18 months or so. Right? So each release, there's a few little changes. You update them. No change should be bigger than a single sprint. Um, and this actually ties in nicely. We were quite inspired by the Chrome release process for the, the browser Chrome. Um, we have three different channels that you can kind of subscribe to. The first is a stable release, which is polished. You know, most of the bugs have been fixed. Uh, we also have a beta channel. And in beta, it's basically we, um, we promote, we cut a new beta release every six weeks, and then we fix bugs in the beta, and then at the end of the six weeks, the beta gets promoted to be the new uh, stable. And then we also have Cuckoo Canary over there, and that's just like uh, Mad Max, no rules, all feature flags enabled. Every new feature that goes into Ember is behind a feature flag, actually, which is quite cool. Uh, it, it really allows a lot of experimentation. It takes the pressure off as an implementer, because you can work on this hack, hack, hack on this feature, uh, and you're under no time pressure. It's like a train. You know, in, in Europe, if you miss the train, who cares? There's another one coming in 10 minutes. Uh, this is six weeks instead of 10 minutes, but hey, close enough. Uh, we are announcing, uh, we announced at EmberConf, the 2.0 beta is being released June 12th, so it's coming very, very soon. All of the goodies that I've shown you, these are all coming, uh, if not earlier, then at least by June 12th. And, and I'm also happy to announce that LinkedIn is actually going to be sponsoring Yehuda and I's work on this going forward, so we'll have plenty of time to focus on Ember, so a big thank you to LinkedIn for all of their support of Ember so far. So again, stability without stagnation is a huge guiding principle in Ember. We know that people are tired of, uh, someone described it to me as, riding the hype dragon. People get so frustrated that when they go investigate the JavaScript ecosystem, it's like there's a hot framework, and then a year later, they're being made fun of for using that hot framework, and it's like, throw that garbage away. What do you mean you're using grunt and backbone? Don't you know that gulp and angular are the hot new thing? And then next year, it's like a new thing. Um, that, that sucks, and I don't think it's a way to have a productive ecosystem. Hopefully what I've shown you here today is that by focusing on stability, focusing on migrating the community, all of us together building these apps and figuring out the best way to build these things, and thinking about how we all help each other get from point A to point B, you can build up to quite, quite large heights. And I'll just um, close. This is something I love to see. This is a, a tweet for some users, and they were just talking about upgrade path. Just went from 1.6.1 to 1.9.1. Wasn't that bad at all. And it's just, we just updated our product from Ember 1.0 RC5 way back in the day. This is like a year and a half ago. All the way up to 1.91. Worked just fine. This is the stuff we love to see. And uh, if you like things like this too, we welcome you into the Ember community. Thank you so much. Okay, I think I have time. I think I have about five minutes for questions. Do you have any questions? Yes, sir. Okay, first I'll just say that's way impressive. As a JavaScript developer who, who primarily uses Angular, I'm just really way impressed by uh, what you guys have done with Ember. That's way cool. Uh, I did have a, a question. Um, so with Fastboot, what what does it take? Uh, if, let's say I've got a, a big Angular or, or Ember app. Um, what would it take for me to implement Fastboot in my Ember app? Uh, that's a great point. Thank you. Uh, so the question is, what does it take to actually add Fastboot to an application? And that's actually a really great question. It's something I meant to touch on in the t on the talk, and I forgot. Uh, to us, Fastboot is not valuable if it's something that five percent of users or ten percent of users use. And there, a lot of people talk about implementing this kind of architecture today using other libraries. Usually there's like a collection of like six libraries that if you smash them together the right way and you kind of wink at it and blow on it the right way, they work sometimes. Uh, but you have to run PhantomJS in production. And for us, that's just not the answer, right? We will not have solved the problem until it's something that everyone can do. And so Today, the way that you add Fastboot to your app, I'm quite proud of, is you simply install an add-on. You say ember install colon add-on ember CLI Fastboot, and boom, it's in your application, and that's it. Now, of course, there are constraints. Um, you cannot run something like just regular jQuery, 
probably you may have plugins that assume a browser. Remember that in Fastboot, we are running your Ember app in Node. And that means no DOM, no window dot, anything. Um, but what I expect to see is that the Ember ecosystem starts migrating towards a way where it'll run in this hybrid mode. We're already starting to see that. So my hope is, again, it's still very alpha right now and the ecosystem starting to support it. But my hope is that in a year or two, you just add the add-on, deploy it to something like Heroku, and boom, done. Nothing special that you need to do so long as you follow the guidelines that we give you. Any other questions? Yes, sir. I'm curious what you think about like, the last streaming stuff or other app stores. Is it Roku? Is it Roku? Is it Roku? Is it Roku? Is it So the question is, will it be as easy on other things like uh, OpsWorks as it is on Heroku? And my hope is that, yes, everything is open. It's out there. It's BSD. We, will, we believe in enterprise and open source working together. We think that the more money is in the ecosystem, the better. <laughs> it's great. Um, so we will do everything that we can. If people want to build companies on deploying fast boot apps, I think that's a great idea. If I had the time and the energy, I would do it myself. Any others? Uh, so the question is, when we compared the performance of uh, React and Ember, where is Angular? Uh, in Ryan's uh, talk from, from React.js Conf, Angular was kind of in the middle. Um, I, I've been, I pay attention to like Hacker News and Reddit and things like this, and the thing that I've heard is that Angular's performance, like in Ember, most of the time, totally fine. Uh, Angular, like Ember, before Glimmer, had some problems with especially long lists. Long lists of things could really slow down Angular. And I've actually, uh, I thought was pretty interesting, I've seen a lot of people, there's a project called NG React, which lets you put React components inside of Angular. Um, I think that's pretty cool. Uh, I believe that Angular is doing some pretty similar stuff in Angular 2.0, kind of along the lines of Glimmer. So uh, it's a very exciting time to be in the JavaScript space. Everyone's competing on performance. Um, everyone's got some great ideas, and everyone's refining on them. So I expect to see Angular quite competitive, if, if not now, then at least when 2.0 comes out. Yes, sir. Um, you know, yep. So, so the question is how to how does Fastboot compare with something like an isomorphic React app? Um, and I think in some ways architecturally they're similar. Um, it's just that we are trying to make it a little bit more drop in out of the box. It's certainly possible to do this kind of stuff. You can run you can render React apps in the browser. Uh, sorry, in Node, you can send that over to the browser. The biggest issue, I think, is one, a lot of patterns in React apps, and particularly Flux apps, rely on global singletons. And what's nice is that Ember has a, a dependency injection kind of state management system that allows us to handle many concurrent requests at once, and that's all kind of baked into the framework from the ground up. If you're running your own Flux stores, you have to be very careful to make sure that you're not crossing state across concurrent requests. And I would say that in general, the ecosystem is not going to be as uh, necessarily as amenable to running on the server, but it's definitely, definitely possible. And we've taken a lot of inspiration from that. Cool, all right, I think I am out of time. Thank you all so very much.